Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, when it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. Seeing that the stone had been rolled away, she ran to Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, crying, He's gone! The master, they, they, the master is no longer in the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid his body. Well, both men ran, but the other disciple reached the tomb before Peter. He saw linen cloths, but he hesitated to enter. When Peter came, he went right in, and he saw cloths. And he noticed how the headcloth had been rolled up and set aside. Then the other disciple came in as well, and he saw, and he believed. You see, until now, they had not understood from Scripture that Jesus would rise again. But then, the men left, and they went home. But Mary stood at the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels all in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the foot. And the angel said to her, Why are you weeping? Because, she said, because they have taken my master and I don't know where they've laid him. And as she said this, she turned, and there was Jesus. But she didn't recognize him. And Jesus said, Why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Thinking he was the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have removed his body, Please, show me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. And Jesus whispered, Mary. And Mary shouted, Rabbi! Rabbi! Eventually, Jesus spoke again. He said, Mary, you must not hold on to me, for I must ascend. But go now and tell the others that I am going to join your God and mine. And so Mary went to the other disciples, and she told them, I... I have seen the Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks. Repentant sinner, worldly woman, Lady of the Night. We have heard a lot of rumors about Mary Magdalene. She's the biblical equivalent of the teenage girl whose digits were scratched into a bathroom stall by a bitter ex-boyfriend. Of course, these rumors have no biblical basis. They're basically the result of a campaign of misinformation that stretches back to the 6th century 
when Pope Gregory the Great conflated Mary Magdalene with that unnamed woman who anoints Jesus' feet, the one Luke refers to as a woman in the city who was a sinner. I guess it made for a good story, because the portrait of Mary as a woman of ill repute has endured the test of time, spilling out in the archetype of the fallen woman that shows up in novels like The Scarlet Letter and Madame Bovary, and our habit of calling charities that reclaim women from the street Magdalene houses. And who could forget that song Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice placed on the lips of Mary in the rock opera Jesus Christ Superstar, I don't know how to love him. He's just a man, and I've had so many men before in very many ways. Is that so? Tradition has not been kind to Mary Magdalene. But when we read the Gospels, we glimpse a different Mary, the real Mary, the Mary whom Jesus sees just as she is and calls by name. Mary Magdalene, the Mary who takes her name from her hometown, the city of Magdala on the shore of Galilee, this Mary features in all four of the Gospels. Luke introduces her as one of the women who travels throughout Galilee with Jesus and the disciples. The twelve were with him, Luke writes, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna and Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their resources. In all four Gospels, Mary Magdalene is among the women standing at the foot of the cross. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mary is one of the women who arrives at Jesus' tomb to find the stone rolled away. But here, in John's resurrection account, it is Mary, and Mary alone, who comes to the tomb early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. I have often wondered, why does the risen Christ come first to Mary Magdalene? Jesus could easily have appeared to Peter and the, quote, beloved disciple whom Mary fetches in the hopeful glow of pre-dawn when she finds the tomb empty. Why not choose Peter? the disciple who, for better or for worse, will become the spokesperson of the church, or the one who was with him, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who we are told sees the empty tomb and believes. Why not surprise them as they take stock of the cast-off grave clothes? Why not appear before them as they step from Jesus' abandoned tomb? before they run home and fall into bed to drift to sleep with images of an empty garden cave fixed in their minds and wake again wondering if it was all just a dream. But instead, Jesus chooses Mary, the one who stands weeping outside the tomb after those other disciples have gone home. He comes to her while she is distraught that someone has taken away the body of her Lord as grief at being denied the chance to anoint Jesus' body piles onto grief that has been festering for three days ever since her teacher was nailed to a tree. Jesus comes to her as she laments that the body of her Lord is missing and with it all the things that Jesus incarnated, love, compassion, grace. Jesus comes to her. He comes to Mary and sends her to go and tell the others. Why? Why? I doubt it's because Mary has taken the necessary courses in preaching so that she can proclaim the good news of Christ's resurrection with an illustration, a joke, and a poem. 
I don't think it's because Jesus wants a woman to bear this unbelievable news. If so, he was really out of touch with the conventions of his day. I suppose it could have something to do with loyalty, that Mary stuck by Jesus to the end after most of the disciples had fled, but that doesn't really sound like Jesus to me to keep score like that. No, I, I think it might have something to do with who Mary is, with her story, her real story, not the one Pope Gregory invented and Andrew Lloyd Webber dramatized. I think it might have to do with the fact that Mary Magdalene knows something about being freed from the tomb. I wish I had made this connection myself, but the credit goes to Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber. She is the one who remembered that throwaway line from Luke's Gospel, the detail that is merely an aside in Scripture, but that I feel sure was central to Mary's story. Mary is the woman whom Jesus had freed from demons, from seven demons, to be precise. So yeah, I think she knew what it was like to be imprisoned by death. And she knew what it was like to be delivered to new life. This is how Nadia Boltz Weber puts it. I think Mary was chosen because she was a woman from whom demons had fled. I think Mary was chosen because she knew what it was like for God to move, not when the lilies are already out in church and the lights are on, but while it was still dark. Because unlike when the men who looked in and saw only laundry, when Mary Magdalene looked in the tomb, she saw angels. Mary Magdalene knows what it was like for God to move. She knows what it was like for God to move, not only in the brightness of a garden where Jesus now walks free, but in a stone-cold tomb sealed against the sun's most persistent rays. Mary knows what it is like for God to move in the darkness where despair roams wild and free, choking out hope and joy and even sometimes love. Mary Magdalene knows. So Mary is not afraid of the dark, not the darkness of night nor the shroud of despair, because she has dwelled there in that darkness herself. So early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, while the other women and the other disciples are still asleep, Mary comes to the tomb, and she lets grief wash over her. But soon enough, her sorrow turns to joy. Soon enough, Jesus comes to this woman who has personally endured torment and trial to show her once again that there is hope beyond despair, that there is healing beyond suffering, that there is life beyond death. Mary's own story is a testament to this truth, so it seems she is uniquely qualified to bear witness to the good news of resurrection. Jesus comes to her while she is weeping in the garden. He comes to Mary and sees her just as she is. He sees her emotional scars. He sees her resilience. He sees her doubt. He sees her faithfulness. He sees Mary. And he calls her by name and tells her to go. He chooses her to go and tell the others a resurrection story. Mary Magdalene becomes the apostle to the apostles. The one sent to share the good news so that others may also go and share the good news. She is the first witness in a long tradition of witnesses. From the apostles who traversed the globe bearing a story of resurrection to the saints of the early church who proclaimed the good news in word and in deed, to the evangelists who crossed stormy seas and planted churches throughout the mid-Atlantic, to us, who are still called to bear witness to the abundant life we know in Christ. 
And like Mary, we have something to say about resurrection because we too know what it's like to go to the tomb while it is still dark. We have all wept salty tears after the death of a beloved or over a diagnosis that shatters the dreams we've dreamed. We have all wondered where the thing we so desperately seek has gone. Where has compassion gone? Where has friendship gone? Where has our sense of peace gone? Where has hope gone? And maybe, maybe these experiences are exactly what makes us qualified to proclaim the good news, to proclaim that there is hope beyond despair, that there is healing beyond suffering, that there is life beyond death. This has been true for a pastor named Scott Weimer, who is a member of what he calls a community no one wants to be a part of, a community of people who have lost loved ones to suicide. Scott and his wife lost their son, Justin, to suicide when he was just 22 years old. This was a young man who had been tormented by the demon of depression and despite counseling and medication could not find release from its grip on his mind. After Justin's death, his father could barely function. I was almost a dead man, Scott said of the grief that followed the countless nights when he found himself standing figuratively at a metaphorical tomb while it was still dark. The thing that pulled Scott from the bottomless pit of despair was his community. That community that no one wants to be a part of, but that is uniquely qualified to speak hope into a hopeless situation because every member has dwelled in such darkness. For Scott, it was the support of one friend in particular, the Reverend Chip Hardwick, that helped him return to the land of the living, so to speak. Chip had lost his stepmother, who was the only mother he'd known for most of his life, also to suicide. Right after she died, someone had told Chip, we are praying for you until you can pray for yourself again. So that is what he told Scott after the death of his son. Chip texted Scott four or five times a week for a long time after Justin died. He wanted his friend to know he was loved, to know that he was not alone in his grief. Recognizing the pain of losing a loved one to suicide, Chip said, even though it will never be good, the God who redeems the cross can redeem my mom's and Justin's deaths. Being able to walk with God and other survivors of suicide is a small step in that redemption. Chip had something to say about resurrection, not because he had unwavering faith, but because he too had stood outside the tomb weeping as he wondered where joy and hope had gone. And because of his own experience of suffering, he was uniquely qualified to speak good news to a friend in the midst of torment and trial. Not superficial good news, not the sunny sentiments of platitudes and sympathy cards, but the gritty good news of a God who moves even in the most persistent darkness. And when Scott eventually healed enough that he could believe once again that hope endures and love sustains, that death is not the end of the story, he too was able to share good news with others. He formed a nonprofit intended to remove the stigma around mental illness so that he can help people like his son, Justin. And because he has dwelled in the darkness of despair, Scott is able to bear witness to a God who is moving even when, especially when, all seems lost. We too know what it's like to walk through valleys shadowed by death and despair. Perhaps we have been held captive by the demons of anxiety or prejudice or fear, 
Maybe we have taken a turn weeping outside the tomb over a loved one lost, or a debilitating disease, or a relationship that seems broken beyond repair. No matter what demons we have suffered, what torment we have endured, what pain we carry, Jesus sees us just as we are. He sees our scars, he sees our resilience, he sees our doubt, he sees our faithfulness, he sees us. And he calls us each by name and shows us that there is hope beyond despair, that there is healing beyond suffering, that there is life beyond death. And then our risen Lord sends us out, uniquely qualified because of who we are, to tell a resurrection story.